how many big losses came out after that day is impossible to guess. There are at least 50 accounts of their apparition. There was one victim, a grocer, who discovered one of these monsters in a sugar cask. And very rashly attacked it with a spade as it rolled. He struck it to the ground for a moment and stunned him with the boot as he struck at it again and cut its body in half. He was the first dead of the two. The most dramatic of the 50 appearances was certainly that of the wasp that visited the British Museum. About midday, dropping out of the blue serene upon one of the innumerable pigeons that feed in the courtyard of that building and flying up to the cornice to devour its victim at its leisure. After that, it crawled for a time over the museum roof and entered the dome of the reading room by skylight. It buzzed about inside it for some little time there was a stampede among the readers and at last found another window and vanished again. Most of the other reports were of mere passings or dissents. The newspaper placards gave themselves up exclusively in the biggest of letters to the gigantic wasps in Kent. Agitated editors and assistant editors ran up and down torturous staircases, bawling things about wasps. And Professor Redwood, emerging from his college in Bond Street at five, flushed from a heated discussion with his committee about the price of bull calves, bought an evening paper, opened it, changed color, forgot about bull calves and committees forthwith, and took a handsome cab headlong for Bensington's flat. Flat was occupied, it seemed to him, to the exclusion of all other sensible objects, by Mr. Skinner and his voice, if indeed you can call either him or it a sensible object. The voice was up very high, slopping about among the notes of anguish. It's impossible for us to stop, so we stop on hoping things will get better. And they've only got worse, sir. It isn't only the wasps, sir. They pretty near give Miss Skinner fit, sir. And the stinging nettles by the rungs, sir. Put its tendril through the window in the night, sir. And very nearly caught Mrs. Skinner by the legs. It's that food of yours, sir, wherever we splashed it about. It's that everything's growing ranker, sir, than I ever thought anything could grow. It's impossible to stop, sir. It's more than our lives are worth. Even if the wasp don't sting us, we shall be suffocated by the creeper, sir. You can't imagine unless you come down to see, sir. He turned his superior eye to the cornice above the redwood's head. How do we know the rats haven't got it, sir? I haven't seen any big rats, sir, but how do I know? We've been frightened for days, and the frightful way the canary creeper was growing. And directly I heard the wasps. Directly I heard them, sir. I understood. I didn't wait for nothing except to throw on a coat. And then I came on up. Even now, sir, I'm half wild with anxiety, sir. How do I know what's happening to Miss Skinner, sir? There's the creeper growing all over the place, like a snake, bigger and bigger, and the wasps. The noise of the wasps, sir, was something awful, sir. So I says to Mrs. Skinner, I'll go up to Mr. Bensington. I'll explain things to him. And you stay in this room till I come back to you, I says. And keep the windows shut. Shut as tight as you ever can, I said. If you hadn't been so confoundedly untidy, began Redwood. 
Oh, don't say that, sir, said Skinner. Not now. Sir, not now with me so dithered, sir, about Mrs. Skinner. I haven't the heart to argue with you. It's the rats. I keep thinking of how do I know they haven't got it, Miss Skinner, while we've been up here. Mr. Skinner might have foregone his chief anxiety. Mrs. Skinner did not stop out her day. About 11, the canary creeper, which had been quietly active all morning, began to clamber over the window and darken it very great. And the darker it got, the more and more clearly Mrs. Skinner perceived that her position would speedily become more untenable. And also, that she had lived many ages since Skinner went. She peered out of the dark, bling window through the stirring tendril for some time and then went very cautiously and opened the bedroom door and listened. Everything seemed quiet. And so, tucking her skirts high about her, Mrs. Skinner made a bolt for the bedroom and having first looked under the bed, and locked herself in, proceeding with the methodical rapidity of an experienced woman to pack for departure. She packed all her own wardrobe and a velveteen jacket that Skinner wore in his finer moments. And she packed a jar of pickles that had not been opened. But she also packed two of the hermetically closed tins containing the food of the gods that Mr. Bensington had brought on his last visit. She was honest and a good woman, but she was a grandmother as well, and her heart had burned within her to see such good growth lavish on a lot of drab chicks. And having packed all these things, she put on her bonnet, took off her apron, tied a new boot lace round her umbrella, and after listening for a long time at door and window, opened the door and sallied out into a perilous world. The umbrella was under her arm, and she clutched the bundle with two gnarled and resolute hands. It was her best Sunday bonnet, and the two poppies that reared their head amidst its splendors of band and bead seemed instinct with the same tremulous courage that possessed her. The features about the roots of her nose wrinkled with determination. She had had enough of it, all alone there. Skinner might come back there if he liked. She went out by the front door, Going that way not because she wanted to go to Hickley Brow. Her goal was cheesing Eyebright, where her married daughter resided. But because the back door was impassable on account of the canary creeper that had been growing so furious ever since she upset the can of food near its roots, she listened for a space and closed the front door very carefully. Behind her, at the corner of the house, she paused and reconnoitred. An extensive sandy scar upon the hillside beyond the pine woods marked the nest of the giant wasps. And this she studied very earnestly. The coming and going of the morning was over. Not a wasp chanced to be in sight then. And except for a sound, scarcely more perceptible than a steamwood saw at work amidst the pines, would have been, everything was still. She went a few paces past the corner, 
came in sight of the rug containing the giant chickens and stopped again. Ah, she said, and shook her head slowly at the sight of them. They were at that time about the height of emus, but of course, much thicker in the body, a larger thing altogether. They were all hens, and five all told, now that the two cockroaches had killed each other. She hesitated at their drooping attitudes. Poor dears, she said, and put down her bundle. They've got no water, and they've had no food these 24 hours, and such appetites too as they have. Then this dirty old woman did what seems to me quite a heroic deed of mercy. She left her bundle and umbrella in the middle of the brick path and went to the well and drew three pailfuls of water for the chicken's empty trout. And then, while they were all crowding about that, she undid the door of the run very softly. After which, she resumed her package, got over the hedge at the bottom of the garden, crossed the rank meadows in order to avoid the wasp's nest, and toiled up the winding path toward teasing Eyebright. She panted up the hill, and as she went, she paused ever and again to rest her bundle and get her breath, and stare back at the little cottage beside the pine wood below. And when at last, when she was near the crest of the hill, she saw far off three wasps dropping heavily westward. It helped her greatly with the rest. She soon got out of the open, and in the high bank lane beyond, which seemed a safer place to her, and so up by Hickory Brow Cone to the downs. There at the foot of the downs where a big tree gave an air of shelter, she rested for a space. And then on again, very resolutely. The giant hens came into Hickley Brow about three o'clock in the afternoon. Their coming must have been a brisk affair, though nobody was out in the street to see it. The violent bellowing of the little Skelmersdale seems to have been the first announcement of anything out of the way. Miss Durbin of the post office was at the window as usual and saw the hen that had caught the unhappy child in violent flight up the street with its victim closely pursued by two others. Probably Miss Durgan was not altogether taken by surprise, in spite of Mr. Bensington's insistence upon secrecy. Rumors of the great chicken Mr. Skinner was producing had been about the village for some weeks. Lord, she cried, it's what I expected. She seemed to have been paid with great presence of mind. She snatched up the sealed bag of letters that was waiting to go on to Earthshot and rushed out of the door at once. Almost simultaneously, Mr. Skelmsday himself appeared down the village, gripping a watering pot by the spout, and very white in the face, and of course, in a moment or so, every one of the village was rushing to the door or window. The spectacle of Miss Durbin all across the road with the entire day's correspondence of Hickley Brow in her hand gave pause to the pulling in possession of Master Skelmer's dead. She halted to one instance in decision and then turned for the open gates of Fulcher's yard. That instance was fatal. The second hen ran in neatly got possession of the child by a well-directed peck and went over the wall 
into the vicarage garden. Hitsmart, the hindmost hen. Hit smartly by the watering can, Mr. Scoundrelsdale had gone. And fluttered wildly over Mrs. Dooley's cottage and into the doctor's field while the rest of those gargantuan birds pursued the first in possession of a child across the vicarage lawn. Good heavens, cried the curate, or, as some say, something more man, and ran, whirling his croquet mallet and shouting to head off the chase. Stop, you wretch, cried the curate, as though giant hymns were the most commonest of all facts in life. And then, finding he could not possibly intercept her, he hurled his mallet with all his might from the man. And it shot out in a gracious curve within a foot or so of Master Scalmersdale's head. And through the glass lantern of the conservatory. Smash! The new conservatory. The vicar's wife. Beautiful new conservatory. It frightened the hen. It might have frightened anyone. She dropped her victim into a Portugal law from which he was presently extracted. Disordered, but uninjured. The hen made a flapping leap to the roof of Fulcher's stables, put her foot through a weak place in the tiles and descended. The rest of the birds were headed off in all directions. They began to be shot at near Fundin beaches, but at first only with a rook rifle. About half past five, two of them were caught very cleverly by a circus proprietor at Turnberg Walls, who lured them into a cage by scattering cakes and bread. when the unfortunate Skinner got out of the southeastern train in her shot that evening. It was already dusk. The train was late, but not in order. And Mr. Skinner remarked as much to the station master. Perhaps he saw a certain pregnancy in the station master's eye. After the briefest hesitation, and with a confidential movement of his hand to the side of his mouth, he asked if anything had happened that day. How do you mean? said the station master, man with a hard and fat voice. That there are wasps in the house. We haven't had much time to think of wasps, said the station master. Really. We've been too busy with your brassed hens. And he broke the news of the hens to Mr. Skinner, as one might break the window of an adverse politician. You ain't heard anything of Mrs. Skinner? asked Skinner. A Mr. Missile shower of pithy information and comment. It was already dark. As dark at least as a clear night in the English June can be. When Skinner, or his head at any rate, came into the bar of the Jolly Drovers and said, hello, you haven't heard anything of this here story about my hens, have you? Oh, haven't we, said Mr. Fulcher. Why, part of the story's just bust into my stable roof, and one chapter smashed a hole in Mrs. Vickers' green house. I beg your pardon, conservative. Skilling came in. I'd like something a little comforting, he said. A gin and water. 
about that figure. And everybody began to tell them things about the giant head. Grace me, said Skinner. You haven't heard anything about Mrs. Skinner, have you? He asked in the pause. That we haven't, said Mr. Winston. We haven't thought of it. We ain't thought nothing of either of you. Ain't you been home today? As Fulcher over a tanker. I suppose there haven't been any trouble with any of the big block today anyway, he asked, with an elaborate detachment of mind. Been too busy with your hands, said Fulcher. I suppose they've all gone in anyhow, said Skip. What? The hens? I was thinking of the wasps more particularly, said Skinner. I suppose nobody endured of any other big things about that thing. Big dog or cats or anything of that sort. A brooding expression came upon the faces of the hippie down Fulcher was the first to give me condensing thought the concrete shape of the A cat to match the men's? Say Fulcher. I said what is good. A catch to Mac Bell's hand. To be a tiger, said Fulcher. More than a tiger, said Winston. When at last Skinner followed the lonely footpath over the swelling field that separated Hickory Rock from the somber pine shaded hollow in whose black shadows the gigantic Canary Creek grappled silently with the experimental fire. He followed it along. He was distinctly seen to rise against the skyline, against the warm, clear immensity of the northern sky. For so far as public interest followed him, and to descend again into the night, into an obscurity from which it would seem he will never more emerge. He passed into a mystery. No one knows to this day what happened to him after he crossed the brow. When later on, Fulchers and Witherspoon came up the hill and stared after him, the night had swallowed him up altogether. The two men stood close there was not a sound out of the wooded blackness that hid the experimental farm from their eyes. To be perfectly frank, I do not believe Skinner ever went back to the experimental farm. I believe he hovered through long hesitations about the field of Hickory Brown and finally took the line of least resistance out of his perplexities and into the incognito. And in the incognito, whether of this or of some other world unknown to us, he obstinately and quite indisputably has remained to this day. <laughs>